I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. So help me God. Welcome, and for so many of you, welcome back to The Oath. I am your host, Chuck Rosenberg. We begin season two of The Oath with an important reflection and a compelling story. Eighteen years ago this week, al-Qaeda terrorists hijacked four planes, crashed them into the north and south towers of the World Trade Center in Manhattan, into the Pentagon, and into a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and killed almost 3,000 innocent people, men, women, and children, on those planes, in those buildings, and on the ground. It was a horrific and devastating attack. It was a tragedy. We lost so many good and decent and caring people, including hundreds of first responders. Many first responders to this day continue to suffer from and die from illnesses incurred during their heroic rescue and recovery efforts. 9-11 was an inflection point in American history and changed the way we think about terrorism and our own vulnerabilities as a nation. Our guest this week on The Oath is Rob Spencer. Rob led the team that prosecuted the only al-Qaeda terrorist ever to face justice in a U.S. courtroom for his role in that 9-11 conspiracy. The story of that investigation and the prosecution of that terrorist, Zacharias Massawi, is both important and fascinating. Rob Spencer, the former criminal chief in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Virginia, who long handled national security cases in that district, knows this story as well as anyone. He lived it. Rob Spencer, welcome to The Oath. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Where are you from? Uh, I was born and raised in Hanover, New Hampshire. My father was a professor at Dartmouth College. He was a chemistry professor. My mother worked at the uh, hospital there as a cardiac technician. Uh, there were four kids. I have three siblings. You're the second oldest. Correct. Yeah. I have two younger and one older sibling. Karen, I know, your older sister, because we were classmates in college. But your two younger siblings uh, took a very different career path than you did. I ended up as a lawyer. Both my younger siblings, my brother still is a musician, and my younger sister was a musician. But my brother, John, has gained some following as sort of a post-punk uh, kind of hard rock musician. The John Spencer Blues Explosion. Was a fairly well-known band, yeah. Yeah. When did you figure out, Rob, that you wanted to go to law school? And when did you figure out you wanted to be a prosecutor? Well, I always kind of thought I'd go to law school. I liked history and politics, and I liked arguing with people. I always kind of figured I would end up going to law school. I actually worked as a paralegal between college and law school, and that didn't dissuade me from going to law school. And I also always had in the back of my mind that I'd like to work as a prosecutor and work for the government. Why? Particularly being a federal prosecutor is really the best job you can have while still being a lawyer. Uh, you're on the for me, on the right side of things, it's full of human drama. There's a lot of interest in doing it. It moves more quickly than civil litigation. So there's a beginning and an end to a lawsuit. You actually get to be a real lawyer. It's like the lawyers you see on TV. You're standing up trying to convince a jury of, of your case. It's fun. You get to hang out with uh, FBI agents and people like that for most of the time. And you're trying to protect society. After playing hockey and lacrosse at Amherst College, you eventually went to the University of Chicago Law School. That's correct. Yep. And what happened after that? Uh, I went and uh, came to Washington, D.C. and took a job at a private law firm and worked there for three years to pay off a uh, few loans I had from law school and try to get a background in litigation. But I always had in the back of my mind that uh, I would go and work for the, the Justice Department. How did you eventually get in? In uh, 1991, the uh, FIREA law was passed, financial institution something, something, something act. It was a uh, an act passed in the wake of the savings and loans scandal. And among other things, it provided for the hiring of a, a number of federal prosecutors to pursue bank fraud claims. And that's what I was hired. I was hired in the criminal fraud section of Maine Justice. And it, this was after spending a couple of years trying to get into a U.S. attorney's office somewhere. But I was hired at the criminal fraud section at Maine Justice and started working on bank fraud cases. And they had at that point two task forces out of D.C., one in 
Texas and one in New England. And I was assigned to the New England Bank Fraud Task Force. Did you like that work? I liked it at bottom when you got to look at the documents and talk to witnesses and realize there were people who were lying and cheating to steal money from mortgage holders in the federal government. But it was slow moving. There was not a lot of work for a lot of new prosecutors. And so in 1992, I got myself assigned as a special assistant U.S. attorney to the Eastern District of Virginia in Alexandria. Which is where we first met. Which is we, where we first met. And it was just an eye opener. It was fast moving. It was fun. You got to stand up in court at least, uh, you know, three, four times a week, if not every single day. And then I spent the next several years trying to get back there permanently and finally got hired back as an assistant U.S. attorney in the summer of 1995. Remember your first trial? Uh, my first trial as a special was a guy named Momo Masakoy. He was a West African immigrant and he was involved in a scheme to sell false Liberian birth documents because at that point, if you were of Liberian origin, you were eligible for what was called temporary protected status. And so uh, along with a gentleman who ended up pleading guilty who worked in the Liberian embassy, it was a scheme where every immigrant of West African origin who wanted to get into the United States suddenly showed up as Liberian and was granted temporary protected status. So Moma Masakoy was part of that scheme, and he went to trial and was convicted. What happened to him? I did some time in jail, and then I assume he got deported, but I got no idea. I know in your career because uh, we worked together for so long that you had some of the most interesting and important cases in the Eastern District of Virginia, uh, particularly when you started a little bit later in your career working on national security matters, including espionage. I wanted to ask you about a couple of those, if you don't mind. As you know well, the Eastern District of Virginia includes the CIA, the Pentagon, and a number of other national security installations. And so we naturally got a bunch of espionage cases. Including the uh, the largest naval base in the world in Norfolk, which is also part of the Eastern District of Virginia. Right. You had a couple of espionage cases that I think are fascinating, but not well known. And I was wondering if you might tell us a little bit about the Squillicote matter. So Terry Squillicote and her husband, Kurt Stand, and a friend of theirs named James Clark were ideologically motivated spies who were originally recruited while they were in college in Wisconsin by the East German Security Service, the Stasi. When there was an East Germany. And then after the, the wall fell and there wasn't an East Germany, the U.S. Uh, obtained the Stasi's file of agents in the United States. And on that list was Terry Squillicote. And so the FBI started watching Terry Squillicote. And there was no East Germany, but then at one point she took out a post office box in a false name and wrote to the communist leader of South Africa pledging that she uh, that she wanted to get back in the in the espionage game and the FBI set up a false flag and met her at the time she was working in the Pentagon and had recently obtained a secret clearance and showed up to a meeting with someone she thought was a South African intelligence agent and actually was an undercover FBI agent. By false flag, you mean a lawful undercover sting operation? Correct. And what about her husband and Mr. Clark? So Jim Clark had worked for the State Department for many years. Our and, State Department. Our State Department. And he actually uh, would send information to his East German handler. And he ended up pleading guilty and testifying against the other two at trial. He never had much of a access to national security information. He didn't have a security clearance, at least at a, at, a, at a high level, but he still trained and sent information to his East German handler. Kurt Stan, that was Terry Squillicote's husband, his role was a recruiter, and he was the one who recruited both his then-girlfriend and his friend Jim Clark. What happened, Rob? Stan and Squillicote went to trial. It was the first espionage trial in, in many years. It, we tried them in 1998 in the Eastern District of Virginia. I was the second chair lawyer on that case to a guy named uh, Randy Bellows, whom you know. Meaning you were the more junior of the two prosecutors. That's correct, yeah. And, and Randy Bellows had done a number of high-profile espionage cases before that. Randy's a state judge now, but was a very, very gifted federal prosecutor. All true. They went to trial. The uh, main defense for Terry Squillicote was entrapment. Uh, the jury didn't buy it. What does entrapment mean? It's when you overcome somebody's will and uh, sort of coerce them or compel them into committing a crime. Lure them into your criminal activity. Yeah. And the law, at least in the Fourth Circuit and that part of federal law, 
that applies to Virginia is merely providing the opportunity for someone to commit a crime is not entrapment. And that carried the day. And her defense failed. Correct. Yeah, they were both convicted. Squillicote, Stand, and Clark have all finished serving their sentences and are out. National security cases have unique complications and unique difficulties. But one of those is the Classified Information Procedures Act, right. sometimes referred to as SEPA. What is it and what does it permit? SEPA was basically enacted in response to a defense tactic called gray mail. If you were a defense lawyer and you were defending a client accused of a national security crime, you would say that you cannot provide a constitutionally mandated defense without releasing classified information. And so the government would face a difficult burden of deciding whether to go forward with the case and have the defense release publicly some classified information or just not pursue the charges. And so prior to the enactment of SEPA, the government would often or occasionally walk away from national security cases because it felt it couldn't risk the disclosure of national security information. Exactly. So SEPA allows to work out pre-trial what the defense really needs for a constitutionally sufficient defense, if anything, from classified information, and whether the government can give some substitution for that classified information. So it allows for a way to decide ahead of time whether the government really will have to release classified information to allow a fair trial, whether it can be cloaked in some manner or substituted for or is not necessary at all for a constitutionally sufficient defense. And with the enactment of SEPA, it made it more palatable for the government to bring national security cases without risking disclosure of sensitive information. Yeah, that's correct. The problem still exists because for a prosecutor, when you have a national security case, it's a little bit of a two-front battle. Because you're facing the defense, but you're also worried about the interests of the national security community. And although they want a spy, for instance, prosecuted, they don't want the national security information, the classified information released publicly. I think that's a really important point. When we bring a bank robbery case or when someone is forging immigration documents, we don't need to go to the intelligence community to help them assess and vet our case. But in the national security arena, we do. We very much do. You need the national security apparatus, the the community, but they're not uh, fully on board with a public trial. And so, for instance, you see a lot of high-level spies who end up pleading guilty. I mean, for instance, Hanson, Aldrich Ames. Explain who Hanson and Aldrich Ames are, please. Ames was a CIA employee who was a spy, I guess, for the Soviet Union. And Hansen was an FBI agent who was a double agent who was spying for the Soviet Union. Both of them caused directly deaths of operatives, and uh, both were initially charged with death penalty offenses, but pled to life sentences in exchange for having the death penalty dropped. And part of the reason that the U.S. government is interested in doing that is because you wouldn't have to have a public trial where you give away sources and methods of intelligence. And that's the trade-off you're referring to. Exactly. In the Squilla Code case, the fact that the United States was able to obtain the East German Stasi files was rather remarkable, wasn't it? It was, and it led to a lot of counterintelligence investigations by the FBI. Some turned out to be dead ends. For instance, there were people listed in those files who must have been listed as targets, as potential agents. Meaning those the Stasi wanted to recruit, but never did. Right. And then there were people who had actually been trained for years in such tradecraft as Terry Squillicote had a miniature camera, and she was trained to photograph documents, take microfiche, roll it up, put it in a doll, and mail it to her handler in East Germany. And so while there were some dead ends, there were probably other counterintelligence successes for the FBI as a result of obtaining those Stasi files. Right. You had another spy case in the Eastern District of Virginia, a fellow named Jean-Philippe Wispelaire. Who was he? So Wispelaire was an Australian national. He was employed in Australia as an analyst of satellite imagery. Australia is one of what's called the five eyes, and the United States shares intelligence information with Australia. So the five eyes for our listeners... They are the closest allies of the United States in the world. New Zealand, Australia, Great Britain, Canada, and the United States compromise the Five Eye community. 
Right. Wisp Belair had access, as employed by the Australian government, to United States satellite imagery. He was a relatively young man. I think he was 27 or so. He decided he was bored in his job as an analyst of satellite imagery, I believe, and he started collecting a bunch of the imagery. He walked into a foreign embassy, offered to sell imagery to a foreign embassy. That embassy contacted the FBI. The FBI posed as a willing buyer of the satellite imagery and met with him, paid him some money, got some of the imagery, which was classified at the top secret level. The FBI asked Wispelaire to come to the United States to sell more of this imagery. There's a reason they wanted him to come to the United States. Because they wanted to arrest him. Unfortunately for him, he flew to Dulles International Airport in the Eastern District of Virginia, where he was arrested, and we charged him with espionage. Did that go to trial? Uh, it did not go to trial. Initially, Mr. Wispelaire and his lawyers claimed that he was incompetent. He was suffering from mental illness and was incompetent to stand trial. Now, why would that matter? Well, you can't try someone who is not mentally competent, who can't assist in his defense, who doesn't know where he is, what's going on. and The, the circumstances of the case. Can't cooperate with his lawyer, can't understand the process. So if someone is truly incompetent, we're precluded from trying them. Correct. What happened? The judge sent Mr. Wispelair to the Bureau of Prisons facility that assesses whether people are mentally competent to stand trial. In Butner, North Carolina. That's right. And he went down there and he was a uh, highly intelligent, pretty convincing guy. And he was assessed by a very young psychologist for the Bureau of Prisons who declared him uh, incompetent to stand trial. I and the FBI asked uh, for our own experts to evaluate Mr. Wispelair. And uh, this was met with some unhappiness by the Bureau of Prisons who thought we were second guessing him. You were. We were. But I had a couple of very good, uh, one very good psychologist and one very good psychiatrist who went down and not only got a chance to interview Mr. Wispelair, but interviewed the staff. And there was a an art therapist with whom Mr. Wispelair interacted at Butner. And the, our team of psychiatric evaluators talked to this therapist who said, what? We, he's not uh, incompetent. We spend all day talking about the uh, great art museums in Europe. And uh, during a subsequent interview with uh, Mr. Wispelair, Wispelair told our team that he was uh, kind of tired of keeping up this act of being incompetent. He admitted. He admitted, yeah. He said, they're, and they're giving me so many drugs that it's actually, it's making me think that I'm actually crazy. He came back to Alexandria and pled guilty, was sentenced to 15 years incarceration. Some of which he actually served in Australia. That was part of the deal, that if it was possible after 10 years for him to serve the last five years in an Australian prison, but I don't know whether he actually did or not. All of this as a prelude, Rob, to your work on what I think is inarguably the biggest case in American history in terms of impact, loss, complexity, and importance. On 9-11... 2001, the U.S. is attacked by Al-Qaeda. You're an assistant U.S. attorney at the time in the Eastern District of Virginia. Do you remember where you were? I was in my office. I remember calling an FBI agent who was coming up from Richmond to work on an extortion case to ask him why he was late. And he said, uh, well, someone just flew a plane into the World Trade Center, so I'm not coming. All bets are off. We're all, it's sort of all hands on deck. First you heard of it. First I heard of it. The federal courthouse in Alexandria, Virginia is about five miles as the crow flies from the Pentagon. After American Airlines 77 had been flown into the Pentagon, we shut down the office at the U.S. Attorney's Office. At that time, I was chief of the major crimes unit. You were the chief of that unit before I was. That was my old job. You left and I took your job. It's a real step down for the office, but what no, the hell. I, I disagree, Robert. Uh, we shut down the office and the only people who remained were... Ken Melson, who was the acting U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of Virginia, and me, we uh, got picked up by the FBI, I think it was in the afternoon, and went over to the Pentagon. It was beginning to be processed as a crime scene. So you were at the Pentagon on 9-11? Well, I was there after American Airlines was crashed into it. It was on fire, actively on fire. They were pulling people out of the Pentagon still, including bodies. There was a field morgue that was set up. You could see large pieces of the plane on the ground outside the Pentagon. 
with the livery of American Airlines clearly visible, the silver uh, exterior skin of the aircraft from the fuselage. And the smell? A fire burning. Um, and the, the smell is sort of burning jet fuel like that is a pretty unique smell. What did you do that day? Sort of looked at the crime scene, saw that it was being handled properly from a forensic perspective. And what do you mean by that? Taking evidence and making sure that it is cataloged for a chain of custody purposes. I mean, it was a chaotic scene. They were trying to keep that part of the Pentagon from the roof from falling in more. There were firefighters in there. There's a recovery effort. There's a firefighting effort. And there's a forensic and evidence collection effort all going on simultaneously. Right. And obviously, the recovery effort, the, the life-saving effort, I think by the time I got there, had concluded. But there are other efforts more important than the forensic effort. But it's still important. Um, Ken Melson and I went with the FBI down into D.C., and went to FBI headquarters and also to the Washington field office. Why? Well, we thought there'd be an investigation starting. There obviously was. This was a time when no one really knew what had happened. I mean, fairly quickly, we were able to figure out that there were, and when I mean we, I really mean the FBI, that there were 19 hijackers on four planes. That United Airlines 93, which was cl- crashed into a field outside Shanksville, Pennsylvania, was one of the hijacked aircraft. But No one knew whether that was it, whether there was an expanded effort, whether some other shoe was ready to drop. And that effort went on for weeks, if not months. With all the national security work you had done as a federal prosecutor, had you worked on terrorism cases? Had you worked on Al-Qaeda? I had not worked on Al-Qaeda. I knew of the work done in the Southern District of New York on Al-Qaeda. Our district, mostly led by John Davis and Jim Comey, had done the uh, Kobar Towers terrorism investigation, but I hadn't done any terrorism work. The uh, bombing in Saudi Arabia. Correct, yeah. While you're not a new prosecutor and you're not new to national security, you're new to Al-Qaeda. That's right. In the succeeding days after 9-11, I think every agent in the FBI was put on finding out what had happened, how it had happened, how we missed it as a national security apparatus from the United States, and whether there was something else, whether there were follow-on attacks coming. And Assistant U.S. Attorney from the Southern District of New York, David Kelly, and I spent the day sitting in a conference room at FBI headquarters. There were two briefings a day of the newly minted director of the FBI, Bob Mueller. And then we would walk across the street from FBI headquarters over to the main Department of Justice building and brief Michael Chertoff, who was then the assistant attorney general in charge of the criminal division. Later the head of uh, the Department of Homeland Security. Correct. Yeah. We would brief Mike Chertoff on where the investigation was going, what we knew in addition. You have two very proud, excellent districts in the Southern District of New York and the Eastern District of Virginia, one with uh, deep al-Qaeda and counterterrorism experience, Southern District of New York, and one with deep national security and espionage experience, Eastern District of Virginia. How was it decided where that case would be brought and how it would be staffed and prosecuted? I would add that each district felt attacked and subject to great loss. The World Trade Center is in the Southern District of New York. The Pentagon is in the Eastern District of Virginia, for instance. Right. Weeks afterwards, the holes in the ground were still smoking in New York. The Pentagon still had a gaping hole in it, even if the fires were out. Each district felt uh, very passionate about prosecuting these cases. Eventually, it came down actually to a little bit of a, a showdown in the Assistant Attorney General's office about which district would get to prosecute this gentleman named Zacharias Massawi. That would, it became pretty clear that that would be the first case to be prosecuted. Before that, we had been working fairly well together. There were grand jury subpoenas issued out of the Southern District of New York and out of the Eastern District of Virginia as part of the investigation. But in the end, I think the location, the close location of the Eastern District of Virginia to Washington, D.C., And the feeling that the Fourth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals was more favorable to national security cases than was the Second Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. Including on issues involving the Classified Information Procedures Act, SEPA, which we had talked about earlier in connection with the espionage work you had done. That's right. And so I think both those factors really militated in favor of the Eastern District of Virginia getting the case 
I know there was concern about whether we would be able to seat a jury in a criminal case in the Southern District of New York in a courthouse that was very close in proximity to still smoldering ruins of the World Trade Center. But as an accommodation, because these are two very fine U.S. attorney's offices, you teamed up to investigate and prosecute the case. We did. And at that point on the Massawi case, which has become the only case tried about September 11th. To this day, ever. To this day, yeah. The lead from New York was Ken Karras, who had just come off the Al-Qaeda, the trial of the Al-Qaeda bombers of the embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. Later, Ken was replaced by, Ken actually was nominated and uh, elevated to the federal bench in the Southern District of New York, and he was replaced by David Raskin, another assistant U.S. attorney from Manhattan. But both Ken and Dave, very talented prosecutors. Right. Only one person was ever prosecuted in an Article Three civilian court in the United States for their role in the 9-11 attacks. Uh, that person was uh, Zacharias Massawi. That's right. Yeah. Who is Zacharias Massawi? Well, Massawi grew up in southern France. He is of uh, Moroccan origin. He actually got a master's degree in the United Kingdom. And he was arrested on August 16th, 2001. In Egan, Minnesota, he drew suspicion by taking simulator training on a 747 jet simulator at the Pan Am International Flight School. He had no business. He had 55 hours in a single engine propeller plane. And that drew attention. That drew attention. He was arrested for overstaying his student visa by the Immigration and Naturalization Service. So as I recall, Robin, you'll know the facts better than me. He came into the United States in February of 2001 student visa would have permitted him to stay for three months. So by August, he was out of status. Is that fair? That's right. And he originally went to Norman, Oklahoma, where he tried to get his private pilot's license at a place called the Airman Flight School in Norman, Oklahoma. Did he draw attention there? Not really. I mean, I think people regarded him as sort of a quirky personality, and that was true until 2006 when he was sentenced. He did not draw attention of law enforcement. Now, You had mentioned earlier that there were 19 hijackers on four planes, and so the math would suggest that he was the 20th hijacker, but in fact, he was not. Yeah, he was called the 20th hijacker by the media, and in fact, he actually adopted that occasionally to sort of poke fun at the United States, but he wasn't. Our theory was that he was a a backup pilot for the fourth aircraft when the putative pilot of that aircraft, Ziad Jara— And when you say pilot, you mean the hijacker pilot— That's right. The person who would, once the terrorists took over the plane, would actually fly the plane. So on every plane, there was one person who had some flight training and other people who were trained in, uh, we called them the muscle, but they would take over the aircraft. Once that plane was taken over, the muscle hijackers would keep the passengers uh, subdued or away from the cockpit, and the pilot would destroy the aircraft and kill everybody on board. And many people on the ground, too. Of course. In the building. Even though Misawi was not the 20th hijacker, and even though he was in a backup role, he is absolutely a member of the 9-11 conspiracy. He was sent to the United States. He's an Al-Qaeda member. We knew that after 9-11 that he was an Al-Qaeda member. There's significant witness information that had seen him at a guest house talking to Osama bin Laden, for example. We knew he was part of al-Qaeda after 9-11. He was sent to the United States to get flight training on August 10th, 2001, when one of the putative pilots, Ziad Jara, got a one-way ticket to go back to Germany to visit his girlfriend. Musawi was sent $10,000 via Western Union by Someone using an alias, Ahad Sabet, using a false passport. That person was Ramsey bin al-Sheib, who was one of the central conspirators. So Massawi was, in fact, a member of the plot, whether he was used on 9-11 or would be used for some other purpose. When we got to the trial, which was a trial on whether Massawi should receive the death penalty or not in 2006, our theory was that Massawi had affirmatively lied to INS and FBI agents in August of 2001. And if he admitted then what he admitted when he pled guilty in the case in 2005, then the FBI and the national security apparatus of the United States would have been able to prevent the 9-11 attacks. So our theory was that he was responsible for the deaths on 9-11 because he affirmatively lied to allow the plot to go forward. 
and his specific role would have changed had Zia Jara not returned from Germany, Massawi would have moved into one of the pilot seats on that day, arguably. Talk a little bit about the investigation and more specifically about the FBI. Uh, what they did in this case was extraordinary. Uh, I'd like you to describe that for our listeners. Starting on the morning of September 11th, 2001, the FBI swung into action and I think every agent and asset of the FBI was dedicated to the investigation. You're talking in excess of 11,000 special agents, as well as all of their analysts, um, lab personnel, and support personnel. In addition to the FBI, there were many other investigative agencies. I mean, for example, the New Jersey State Police, the Port Authority Police Department, Port Authority lost a number of police officers in the World Trade Center, the NYPD, the New York Police Department, many other federal and local law enforcement agents lent support and were intimately involved in the investigation. It was the largest criminal investigation, at least that I know of, in history. There were squads in the New York field office of the FBI who had been dedicated to al-Qaeda. There was- Prior to 9-11. Prior to 9-11, before 9-11, there was a Osama bin Laden unit at FBI headquarters whose main responsibility was trying to find evidence on Osama bin Laden. At the CIA, they had people and resources dedicated to al-Qaeda. So all those resources were dedicated to the investigation. There were uh, the squad in New York, many people, dozens of FBI agents, were relocated from New York City down to the Washington, D.C. area, and they stood up a squad that had a room in the basement of FBI headquarters, a 1B999. I've been in that room. Not very luxurious accommodations, and the FBI gave the investigation the name Pentbom, P-E-N-T-T-B-O-M. And refers to the Pentagon, the Twin Towers, and to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, where United 93 crashed in a field in Somerset County. That's right. Yep. Over time, though the FBI had really turned on a dime that day and dedicated all of its resources to the 9-11 investigation, the group investigating it and working with the prosecutors got winnowed down to a core group of extraordinary agents. Who were they and what did they do? There were a core group of agents, a number of whom got moved from New York to Washington, D.C., and eventually moved to the D.C. area permanently. Aaron Zebley, Jackie McGuire, Joan Marie Turciano, Jim Fitzgerald, Matt Walsh, Brian Getson. I could go on. Lisa I. They worked full-time from September 11th, 2001 until we concluded with the Massawi trial in May 2006. Some of them are still working al-Qaeda work to this day. Even at some point, a virtual FBI field office was stood up in the Eastern District of Virginia, so these agents would be right next to the prosecutors working on the case, including you. That's right. We had what are known as SCIF, Secure Classified Information Facilities, where they could look at classified information, process it on dedicated closed system computers, et cetera. But that's right. We had FBI agents in our office. Talk a bit, Rob, about um, the volume of information that these agents and the prosecutors assigned to the case had to process. When the FBI does a report of investigation, it becomes what's called a Form 302. That's the form on which they record their interviews. That's right, yes. And other investigative agencies have different indications, but these reports of investigations numbered in the hundreds of thousands, all relating to the investigation of how al-Qaeda was able to do this, whether there was another attack that was imminent in the weeks after 9-11, etc. When was Massawi indicted? Massawi was indicted on December 11th, 2001. For what? Well, being a member of al-Qaeda, being part of a conspiracy to kill Americans, using an explosive device in a crime of terrorism. You're referring to the fact that each plane was filled with jet fuel. As a matter of law, that's an explosive device. Right. Were you seeking the death penalty? Yes, we did seek the death penalty, and that became a matter of some controversy. I mean, typically when you have a murder case, and one of the conspirators is in prison at the time of the murder, you would think that that person may not be eligible, didn't pull the trigger, may not be eligible for the death penalty. Our view and the view of the attorney general at the time was that in this case, a case of this magnitude, someone who was part of the conspiracy, someone who affirmatively lied to allow his terrorist brothers to carry out the plot to kill as many Americans as possible should be eligible for the death penalty. I think that's a really important point, Rob. In the more typical death penalty case, the defendant has pulled the trigger. In this case, the act that led to the death of others 
was the fact that Masawi had lied. Not only is that a difficult proof, I think it's unique. I can't think of another death penalty case where the act was predicated on a lie. I think that's right. It was an affirmative lie that permitted the 19 others to go forward and kill nearly 3,000 Americans. So how did you prove that had Massawi told the truth in August when arrested by immigration officials, had he told the truth, he would have prevented the attack? In April of 2005, Massawi pled guilty to the entire indictment. And we had him sign a relatively simple statement of facts. There were several basic points that he admitted to in that. He was a member of Al-Qaeda, that there was an existing plot in the United States to hijack planes using short-bladed knives. Which he knew about. which And fly them into buildings. And that he had received money by wire transfer in August to go get jet simulator training from a member of Al-Qaeda. If he had disclosed those basic facts, we put on a witness, an FBI agent, Aaron Zebley, to testify that using those basic facts, it would have been possible and the FBI would have found the 19 hijackers and dismantled the plot before September 11th. Essentially in three plus weeks. The key to that is, I mean, there were two keys. One, if you look at the Western Union wire to Massawi on August 10th under the name Ahad Sabet, if you trace that back, you see that it came from Hamburg, Germany, and the money went to Hamburg from the United Arab Emirates. The phone number used to transfer the money to Hamburg from the United Arab Emirates can be tied to some of the hijackers. And so just using standard investigative techniques, uh, cross-checking numbers and addresses, wire transfers uh, and the like, you would have located some number of the hijackers, including the pilot hijackers, in relatively short order. If you know Al-Qaeda members are in training at flight schools and on jet simulators, it's relatively easy to track down those people. After the fact, when the FBI went to some of these flight schools and jet simulator centers and said, you know, have you ever heard of these people? The instructors at those places seemed to remember all those hijackers. They stood out. They were of Arabic descent. Their English wasn't particularly good. They seemed to be loners and, and um, sometimes would exhibit extremist views. And their flight skills were rudimentary. Correct. Yeah. And particularly on jet simulators, if you're flying a jet simulator, like Masawi had 55 hours in a single engine propeller-driven plane, the other students at the Pan Am International Flight Academy on a 747 simulator are military veterans looking to move to the civilian aircraft pilot world or already civilian pilots looking to upgrade or recertify their status as pilots of large multi-engine jet aircraft. There was another theory to the case, Rob. Not only would standard investigative techniques, had Masawi told the truth, lead you to the other hijackers, but also in his statement of facts, there's mention of a short-bladed knife. Why is that important? Well, our theory was that if the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, had realized that there was an extant plot to hijack aircraft using short-bladed knives, that gate security could have been tightened to prevent people from getting on the planes with short-bladed knives. At, the, at that time, it was permissible. At that time, it was permissible. And in fact, the, the hijackers, the 19 hijackers, used, uh, used box cutters, you know, very sharp razor blades contained in some type of handle. Masawi, when he was arrested, had two short-bladed knives on him that he had bought in Oklahoma before going to Minnesota. And Masawi said that he knew that he would be able to get through a gate with a knife that had a blade shorter than his pinky. He, he told us that. He testified to that, actually. Um, and so that was, our, that was our theory, that that would have allowed gate security to be tightened down and, and uh, would have prevented the hijacking. On 9-11, almost 3,000 people died, innocent people, on the planes, in the towers, on the ground, at the Pentagon, uh, in uh, Shanksville, Pennsylvania. It was, it, and it remains, and I hope nothing ever approaches it, as the biggest mass casualty crime in United States history. How did you approach the victims of the case, including the survivors? Credit to this goes to David Novak, the third primary trial team member, who was a death penalty expert, assistant U.S. attorney in Richmond, Virginia. Now a federal magistrate judge. Now a federal magistrate judge. And uh, Dave used to uh, 
cajole us all the time that we needed to treat this as a regular murder case, except with nearly 3,000 victims. What does he mean by that? To go and find the victim impact evidence, to find out the effect of the murders on the families, on the loved ones, on the community. And so we set up a system where we offered to interview the families of every victim, not only the families of those killed, but any surviving victims who wanted to talk to us. People who were injured, but who didn't die. Right, right. And so we set up teams that were comprised of an agent or a police officer, a victim witness specialist, and a prosecutor. And any family or uh, surviving victim who wanted to come in and talk to us could come in and talk to us. And we held these sessions in New York, in Virginia, in New Jersey, and I think in Boston. Did you participate in that? I did. I, I did not go to New York. I participated in the ones around the D.C. area. We actually, among the prosecutors, we divided up the flights, and I was primarily responsible for American Airlines 77, which was hijacked from Dulles in the Eastern District of Virginia in my home district and flown into the Pentagon also in my home district. So I participated in a number of these for victims who were either in the Pentagon and were killed or injured or were on American Airlines 77. What was that like, Rob? I imagine it had to be extraordinarily difficult. It was incredibly emotional. It was both incredibly difficult and sad, and there were moments of real joy when people would remember their loved ones and you know how wonderful these people were. But overall, it was an exceptionally wrenching experience. You would have these sort of hardcore New York detectives weeping along with the family. It was remarkable, and I think we ended up talking to over 1,300 families. We also set up a file for every single victim. We could identify all the, at the time, there were 2,972 fatalities. There are more since. Yes, that's right. I mean, people have died from illness or injury after the fact. I mean, for instance, the people who were first responders who have died of cancer since then. So that number has grown. But at the time of the trial, that was the number. And also people who were injured. And I credit Karen Spinks, who is the victim witness coordinator in Alexandria, Virginia. I'm glad you mentioned Karen. Tell us about her. She was a longtime victim witness coordinator in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Alexandria, Virginia. And she was fantastic, an exceptionally empathetic person, could arrange anyone getting to trial, was great with the victims, was great comforting witnesses and victims. And I think it was Karen's idea to set up a file for each victim. And families would send us clippings, letters, remembrances of their loved ones, photographs. We put in media articles about particular people, obituaries. And after we were done with the whole trial, the Smithsonian asked us for that information, and we passed it on. I remember walking around the first floor of the U.S. Attorney's Office in Alexandria. It's a five-story building, and the walls were lined with drawings and photographs. There were boxes everywhere, letters from people about those they had lost. It was breathtaking. Yeah, it really was. It was a a really sad but remarkable experience. Did you ever cry during those interviews? Yes, of course. Well, um, I sat in court every day for the sentencing phase and uh, cried every day. There were moments in the sentencing phase, particularly when the victim witness testimony was on, where there was not a dry eye in the house. There was a a sketch artist for a major newspaper who said to me after the fact, I've just never seen anything like this. The testimony was so emotional and so wrenching. And he said, I've always been opposed to the death penalty, but if there was ever somebody who deserved it, it was this guy. One of the reasons you reached out to 1,300 victims was so that you could find some number who could testify at the sentencing phase of the Massawi trial, who could tell the story of grief and loss so the jury would understand the victim impact of the case. And we selected about 50 stories of victim impact, tried to represent those killed surviving family members, New York, Shanksville, Pennsylvania, the Pentagon, American Airlines 77, every one of the four flights. As well as uh, more than 300 New York City firefighters, dozens of NYPD and Port Authority police officers, civilians on the ground. It's almost an immeasurable loss. Those above the uh, fire in the World Trade Towers, those in the Pentagon, that's right. We tried to make it representative and we tried to make the 50 
victim impact stories compelling. At trial during the, that phase of the sentencing, we were permitted to put on about 25 of these stories. Um, we were limited by the judge, Judge Brinkema, but I think that was sufficient. What's the purpose of an opening statement, Rob? Is to let the jury know what you will prove during trial. And in this instance, it was to to recall the incredible horror and pain of that day and to emphasize Massawi's role in it. Rob, you gave the opening statement in the Massawi trial at the penalty phase. I thought it was one of the most compelling, moving opening statements I have ever heard in federal court out of the mouth of any prosecutor. Would you read the first part of that for us today? Of course, Chuck. September 11th, 2001, dawned clear, crisp, and blue in the Northeast United States. In Lower Manhattan, in the twin towers of the World Trade Center, workers sat down at their desks, tending to email and phone messages from the previous days. In the Pentagon, in Arlington, Virginia, military and civilian personnel sat in briefings, were focused on their paperwork. In those clear blue skies over New York, over Virginia, and over Pennsylvania, in two American Airlines jets and in two United Airlines jets, weary travelers sipped their coffee and read their morning papers as flight attendants made their first rounds. And in fire and police stations all over New York City, the bravest among us reported for work. It started as an utterly normal day, but a day that started so normally and with such promise soon became a day of abject horror. By morning's end, 2,972 people were slaughtered in cold blood. And that clear blue sky became clouded with dark smoke that rose from the trade towers of New York, from the Pentagon in Virginia, and from a field in rural Pennsylvania. And within a few hours out of that clear blue sky came terror, pain, misery, and death. And those 2,972 never again saw their loved ones, never again gave their kids a goodnight kiss. That day, September 11th, 2001, became a defining moment, not just for 2,972 families, but for a generation. Killers were among us that day, and for more than just that day. Those killers had lived among us for months, planned for years to cut our throats, hijack our planes, and crash them into buildings to burn us alive. On that day, September 11th, 2001, a group of cold-blooded killers from distant lands capped their plan, their conspiracy, to kill as many innocent Americans as possible. Those killers, part of the terrorist group Al-Qaeda, came up with their plan, trained for it, practiced it, worked on it, kept it secret, and then carried it out, hijacking four commercial planes on September 11th and crashing them on purpose to kill as many Americans as they could. One of the people in that plan, one of the conspirators, is among us still, right here in this courtroom today. That man is the defendant, Zacharias Massawi. Rob, you said on one hand that Massawi pled guilty in 2005, right. but on the other hand, there was a sentencing phase uh, in court. Explain the nature of a bifurcated death penalty proceeding, if you would. So under the federal death penalty rules, a death penalty, once guilt has been established, a death penalty trial, which is what we had here, is broken into two phases. One is whether the defendant is eligible for the death penalty by causing death, and the second is whether that defendant ought to be given the death penalty. So talk about that first phase, whether the defendant, whether Ms. Sally was eligible for the death penalty. So the question there really was what we had talked about earlier, whether he caused deaths. The jury found that he, he had, and we should proceed to the second phase, which was whether he ought to receive a sentence of death. And that's where the victim impact testimony becomes so important. That's right. During the second phase of the bifurcated sentencing trial. Did Massawi fight it? He fought it. I think he felt it was his duty as the sworn enemy of the United States to fight it the whole way, despite what some people say that terrorists would feel that he was a a martyr to be put to death at the hands of the enemy. I don't think that qualifies as martyrdom, and he fought it uh, the whole way. He testified in both phases of the sentencing trial. What did he say? Well, he basically took full credit and pleasure. He was happy 
that he and his brothers had caused nearly 3,000 deaths. He pledged that he would try to kill every American he could until he got every one of us, basically. He took considerable joy at the suffering that he had caused. And we talked about the FBI team. We talked about the victim witness specialists. Uh, there's another group that is often unsung. It was the, the individuals who were appointed uh, as his defense counsel to represent him. And I think it's worth saying a word about them, too, if you don't mind. Masawi was given appointed counsel in the United States. He couldn't afford a lawyer. That's correct. And the team initially was led by Frank Dunham, who was the public defender in Alexandria, Virginia, Eastern District of Virginia. He was, Frank was supported by his staff at the public defender's office, the federal public defender. But he also had several lawyers who were private lawyers who were appointed Alan Yamamoto, who is a well-reputed local criminal defense lawyer. Wonderful gentleman. And Ed McMahon, who was also a well-reputed local criminal defense lawyer. And their job was to keep him alive. Their job was to keep him alive and have him found not guilty if possible. Even though they were among the Americans uh, that Misawi wanted to kill. That's correct. And your sense of their work? They did the best they very good, very well could under extremely difficult circumstances. When you've, you've a client who doesn't trust you, whose avowed mission in life is to kill you and, and your fellow countrymen, and doesn't want to take your advice. They did their jobs as appointed defense counsel with uh, great reverence for the rule of law and for their obligations to their client, whether or not their client liked it. And the other person I should mention on the defense team is Jerry Zirkin, who had dedicated his life to fighting the death penalty for everybody. And Jerry was their death penalty expert on the defense. Describe Masawi's conduct in court. I think before the trial, he tried to be as mischievous as possible. He would write insulting pleadings in his own hand to the judge, would insult his own lawyers. I think he tried to throw as many monkey wrenches in the system as he could. Masali was belligerent throughout the trial. He was an avowed killer. He reveled in the pain and misery uh, that al-Qaeda had caused. Did he get a fair trial, Rob? He did, and I think he even admitted so after the fact. And I think that's one of the things the trial stands for, is that we were able to give even our avowed enemy, who told us at trial that if he could, he'd come back and kill every one of us, a fair trial. Who was responsible for making sure he got a fair trial? Well, the system is set up in that manner, but a lot of the credit goes to Judge Laney Brinkema, who presided over the trial. What do you mean by the system? Well, everybody. The judge, appellate courts in this instance, the defense lawyers who were uh, charged with providing him a defense, and the prosecutors who played by the rule, and the investigators who also played by the rules. It really is remarkable that somebody who wants to kill Americans and who despises our way of life, received from Americans a fair trial. I think that I think we gained some begrudging respect even from Zacharias Masawi at the end of the case. Isn't that one of the beauties of the Article Three system, that it's public, that anybody can walk into any courtroom anywhere in the United States and watch this system at work? Again, set up. Yes, it is, and it's set up to be that way. What did the jury do in the end, Rob, with the Masawi case? We discussed earlier that the jury found that Masawi had caused deaths and so was eligible for the death penalty. Then they listened to the evidence put on by the prosecution, the victim witness evidence, impact evidence. And they also listened to the defense put on witnesses saying that Masawi should not be given the death penalty. In the end, the jury, they were hung. They did not find that he should receive the death penalty. And so Judge Brinkema in May of 2006, sentenced Masawi to six life terms. We learned later that the jury had hung 11 to 1 in favor of the death penalty. And to be clear, hung jury is anything other than a unanimous jury. That's right. You can't sentence someone to death unless it is unanimous, 12 jurors to none. How did you find out that it was 11 to 1 for the death penalty? So in 2006, I had an acquaintance who was a law professor in Minnesota and he put on a forum at which Ed McMahon, one of the defense lawyers, and I talked about the trial. And during the question and answer period, a gentleman stood up and said he was one of the jurors and he was the one who had voted against the death penalty. 
Did you talk to him? I didn't talk to him one-on-one. There's a, a standing rule in the Eastern District of Virginia that you cannot talk to jurors afterwards without the court's permission. What I know is what he volunteered in a public setting. Over time, Rob, how do you feel about the verdict of the jury? and your work on the case. I'm not a death penalty hawk. I think he deserved the death penalty. I respect the jury's work tremendously. I think that the case is important for many reasons. We gave the victims a voice. We showed that a terrorism case, even of this magnitude, can be tried in the Article Three criminal courts in the United States. And I think that spending the rest of his life in prison in solitary confinement, which is where Massawi is in the Supermax Penitentiary in Colorado, is a, a just punishment for him. And we should mention there is no parole in the federal system. There's no parole in the federal system, and he has multiple life terms. So that's where he will die. Correct. Yeah. Rob, what's an Article Three court? Article Three under the Constitution sets up the uh, civilian justice system in the United States. So it's other than a military court, for instance. Right. Criminal cases brought by the United States are brought in the federal courts. It's all set up by Article Three of the Constitution. Massawi remains the only person ever tried in an Article Three court in the United States in connection with the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Generally speaking, are Article Three courts equipped to handle these types of cases? What's their record of success in handling terrorism? I think the record is undefeated. I mean, both the work done in the Eastern District of Virginia and in the Southern District of New York, and now in some, some other districts as well, with which I'm less familiar, I think Article Three courts have shown time and again that the courts are equipped to handle major terrorism cases, handling the defendants appropriately, and not risking the release of classified information. Do you still think about the case and about the victims? Still do, all the time. Think about the many, many teammates who worked on the investigation in the trial. Think about those still working on it, but particularly about the victims. And it's remarkable to me every September 11th that rolls around that it's been so many years since then, but it seems like just yesterday. That was the last case you ever tried, wasn't it? It was, right. How soon after did you leave the office? I left in July of uh, 2006. The case ended May 4th, 2006. Do you miss the work? I do. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm pleased with how things have gone since then, but it's, again, it, being a federal prosecutor is the greatest job in the world. It was really an honor and a privilege to have any part to contribute to the response to the September 11th attacks. I was your colleague for some of this. I was your U.S. attorney for a little bit of this. Uh, I, I want to say this about you, Rob, and your team, a team of prosecutors and agents, of support personnel and paralegals, of analysts and uh, forensic scientists. Uh, it was the most extraordinary work I have ever seen in my entire Justice Department career. I'm in awe of what um, you all did. A lot of people worked very hard. I was privileged to have worked with such fine people. Uh, very grateful to you, Rob, for sharing that story with us. Um, thanks for having me in, Chuck. It's hard to believe, as I said before, another year goes by, and in some ways it seems like a, a long ways off, and some days it, it just seems like just yesterday. Thanks for uh, sitting down with us on the oath, Rob. Chuck, thanks for having me in. I appreciate all you've done. Thank you for listening to my interview with Rob Spencer, the lead prosecutor in the 9-11 case. The 9-11 attacks were a tragedy, but also an inflection point in U.S. history. Particularly this week, it is vital that we remember that September day, 18 years ago. It is equally important that we remember the 3,000 people we lost and continue to lose as a result of those attacks. Roughly one-fourth of the current U.S. population has been born since that horrific day. It is important for all generations to listen, learn, and reflect. The investigation and prosecution that Rob Spencer described is crucial to understanding those events and how we have changed and evolved as a nation since. If you would like to learn more about those attacks, the 9-11 Commission report is an excellent place to start. That report is extremely well-researched and written and a dependable source of information about 9-11, the history leading up to it, and our nation's response. We have a link to that report in our show notes. As for our show, after a brief summer break, The Oath is back. We pick up Season 2, where we left off with Season 1. 
with incredible guests and fascinating conversations. In the coming weeks, we will publish an interview with retired four-star Admiral William H. McRaven. Bill McRaven had a legendary career as the longest serving Navy SEAL in U.S. history and as the commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command. Bill was involved in planning and executing some of the most significant operations in recent history, including the capture of Iraqi President Saddam Hussein, the rescue of Captain Phillips from Somali pirates, and the operation to capture or kill Osama bin Laden. But Bill McRaven's story is not just about high-profile successes. It is also about struggle and loss, about truth and honor, and about humility and second chances. We will also soon publish an interview with Kathy Remler, one of the lead prosecutors on the Enron case, the largest corporate fraud in U.S. history. After successfully prosecuting Enron Chairman Ken Lay and Enron CEO Jeff Skilling, Kathy served as White House counsel to President Barack Obama. As one of the youngest lawyers ever in that crucial role, she helped shepherd the Affordable Care Act through the Supreme Court and into law. So please make sure you are subscribed to The Oath on whichever platform you use to listen to podcasts. And if you have not yet left a five-star review for us, please join the 7,600 plus people who have. As we embark on season two, several words of thanks. Thank you for making our first season such a great success. Thank you for listening to our podcast and for telling your friends and family to listen too. Thanks for giving us thoughtful feedback and for rating us so highly on your favorite app. We are approaching 2 million downloads for our first season and we are humbled by your support. Thank you. If you have any thoughtful criticisms, feedback, or questions about this episode or others, please email us at theoathpodcast at gmail.com. That's all one word, theoathpodcast at gmail.com. And though I cannot personally respond to every email, please know that I read each one of them and that I definitely appreciate it. Thank you. The Oath is a production of NBC News and of MSNBC. This podcast was produced by the wonderful team at Fanny Co. with Fanny Cohen, Nick Bannon, and Rob Aber. Barbara Rabb is our senior producer, and Steve Lichtai is our executive producer. Thanks to Archie Moore and the good folks at Clean Cut Studios in Washington, D.C. for hosting today's interview. This is The Oath with Chuck Rosenberg. Thank you so very much for listening.